Sunday morning, family. It's Lady Mara with this week's VP News and Views. Our theme for 2023, this is the year to seek God's presence and purpose, according to Psalm 1611. Children's Church takes place directly following praise and worship every Sunday, excluding fifth Sundays. Ladies, because the women of Vernon Park have been so blessed, we were asked if we could continue sharing notes, cards, or letters. Absolutely you can. Feel free to continue randomly blessing the women. And thank you for your heart to bless others. Calling all men, join the Men of Destiny third Saturdays monthly, 1230 to 230. We are a family that prays together. Please keep the names on our sick list in your prayers. Sister Kim Giddens. Sister Renita Poindexter. Brother Walter Mitchell. Sister Lindsay Dark. Sister Theodora Barnett Bolden. Sister Laureen Johnson. And pray for our bereaved sister Alberta Trotter Stallworth in the loss of her cousin, Sister Velma Williams. Deacons Mildred and Daryl Robinson in the loss of her brother, Willie Nash. That concludes the video announcements for VP News and Views. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Pastor Jay here. Whenever we present the Word of God at Vernon Park, whether it's the Bible studies or Sunday mornings, we try to do it in unique ways. My wife, Mara, has this wonderful talent that she presents on stage and TV shows and movies as an actress. However, God has given her a special anointing of evangelism to bring women of the Word to life on stage. Recently in a conference in California, she just did that, the story of Rahab. So join us this morning as we enjoy during this year of seeking God's presence and purpose, this evangelistic tool and gift of Rahab presented by Lady Mar. My name is Rahab. Some of you may have read about me. Others of you may know a little bit about me. But I doubt there is anyone in this room that really knows who and or what I am. You may have heard the phrase Rahab the prostitute, no? Hands, hands. How many of you have heard of Rahab the harlot? Hands. Is there anyone in this room who has heard I was Rahab the innkeeper? Hands. Huh? titles about me they are true but there is so much more to who I am if there a person in this room who used to do something that people labeled you as doing but you no longer wear those labels hands maybe you were a fornicator do not raise your hand these people will judge you Perhaps uh, you were an adulterer. You definitely do not raise your hand. They will definitely judge you. Maybe you struggled with uh, homosexuality. You know you will be judged. And there are those of you may have been a liar. Is there anyone in here that used to lie all the time? Maybe you cursed like a sailor. Your mouth was a potty mouth, maybe. Perhaps we have crooks, thieves, ex-crooks, of course, and thieves. Maybe even murderers, convicts, criminals. Perhaps there are people in this room that have been to prison, incarcerated. But you know, you are more than the labels that you were. 
there is more things that happen between the place that you did what you did and who you are now. This too is my story. So my name is Rahab. Yes, I am a prostitute. I am also a Canaanite woman and I live in Jericho. I am an unmarried woman and I do not have any children. But I have to explain to you, my life was not always an easy life. I did not have some of the skills that my brothers or my sisters had. So I used what I had to get what I needed. And you may think this is a bad thing. You may even judge me because of these things. But everyone needs a roof over their head, no? People need food on their table, no? So I did what I had to do to get what I needed in order to live, in order to survive, in order to take care of myself. But as this harlot, as this uh, prostitute living in Jericho, I had a house on the side of town where they put people like me. You know they don't want to see us, right? They just sit us aside so that we are not exposed to all the people. But what they did not know is sitting my house onto the wall of Jericho at the edge of town was a benefit to me. Because what I do, it is all about location, location, location. <laughs> because the people that come to see me, these men do not want to be seen coming to see me. No, they do not want people in their business. So they come and they sneak into town and they visit me and no one knows they are there. And also, when these men are leaving town, telling people bye-bye, <laughs> they can stop in and see me without anyone seeing them. How many of you know what people mean for bad can set you up for good? Well, that's what happened to me. Because if they had allowed my house to be in the middle of the city where all the people are around, you know the looky loo the nosy people, the people that gossip about you all the time. There is Rahab. Look who went into her house. Isn't that sister so-and-so's husband visiting Rahab? <gasps> he has been to Rahab's house five times this month. What is she doing to he? You know the people and how the people act and how the people talk about you. And yes. I may joke with you about this story, but there is nothing more lonesome than being able to spend time with these men, knowing that they come to see me, but they don't want to be seen with me. But for a few moments or a few hours while they are in my home, I feel like I feel needed. Sometimes I even feel desired. So for those moments, I am comforted. And yes, it helps that they leave me money and I can pay for my bills. But the emotional part of me for that moment, it is okay. So that is a part of who I am. And I do not apologize for that. So let me tell you what happened and how my life was changed. There was a knock at my door, which is not unusual. People visit me. I go to my door and there are two men. I welcome them into my home, thinking they are coming to see me. And these men are not interested in seeing me like this. I begin to talk to these men and I realize these men are spies. These men 
are spies. Joshua, the son of Nun, has sent spies into Jericho because we have been hearing they are going to overtake everything. We have been melting in fear because of these men. And as I am talking to them, because as a prostitute living on the side of town, I know that somebody could have seen these men come into my house. So I tell them, wait here. I will go and make sure no one has seen you. I go to the door. I open up. And I don't see anyone on the streets pointing towards my house. I don't see anyone gossiping or whispering, but that does not mean that there was not anyone who saw them come into my house. So I quickly close the door and I think real quick, because with my job, you got to think quick. And I go to them and I say, I tell you what I want you to do. I am going to take you to the roof and I want you to go up the stairs and I want you to hide underneath the flax seeds that I have on the roof because if you hide up there if the guards come into the house they will not find you but when you go up do not move do not leave stay there until I come and tell you because I am also thinking I need to have a plan for you but I do not have this plan just yet. So I need them to wait for me. So I rush them in back to the roof and they go all the way up the stairs and I watch them. And as soon as they are out of sight, there is another knock at the door. Oh, my heart is beating so fast. But I know I must get to the door quickly because I do not want, if it is the guards of the king, to know that I have these men here. I hurry and then I slow down. I open the door. Hello. <laughs> you come to see me. And these men are not buying it at all. They go, the king sent us here because we heard you have let spies into your house. And we need you to bring them out here right now. I think quickly. I say, the spies did come and see me, but they left. They left that way. You should go. You should go quickly. And they run off. And I am glad. But let me tell you, I was so scared. If the king knew that I had lied to these men to protect these men, I do not know. That would have been my life. I risked my life to save their life. And I don't even know them. But what I do know is these people, Joshua's people, these Israelites, they had been doing some amazing things. Their God had caused this Red Sea to just part. And it was a walls of water. And he allowed all of the Israelites to walk across the water on dry land. What did you want that kind of God? He had allowed these people to go in and overtake towns and city, the Amorite king, Sihon and Og. All of these things were being taken by these people. I wanted their God. So when those soldiers left, I knew they may leave and try to come back, but they closed the city gates behind them and I felt comfortable knowing that they were on their way to look for people they will never find. So I went and eventually I go up the stairs to have a conversation and do a little business with my new friends. Get your mind out of the gutter, not that kind of business. I have a conversation with these men and I tell them, your God is the God of the heavens above and the earth below. I believe your God is that God because I have seen him in the conversations people are telling me do amazing, miraculous things. And I know here in Jericho, we have been worshiping idols. Idols that cannot part a sea. 
Idols that cannot go before us and stop a brook in the Jordan River. Idols who cannot go before us as if we are a huge army and kill and destroy an entire town. No, their God was a real God. And I wanted in because as a prostitute, I know how to negotiate. And some of you may have got what that means. Negotiate. I'm an entrepreneur and I negotiate. So I negotiated the best deal I have ever had before. I tell these two spies, listen, this is what I want you to do. I saved your life and now I need you to save my life, but not just my life. I need you to save my mother and my father and my sisters and brothers and nieces and nephews, everyone that is in their house. I need you too to save. And they say, we will do it. <gasps> You know how on the inside you are like screaming, <laughs> but on the outside you're acting like I knew you would. Well, that's what I was doing. On the inside, I was so full of joy because I knew that meant that me and my entire family would be saved. So I say, great, thank you, thank you. I say, I'm going to let you down out of this window. On the side of the wall, I have explained to you how my town has my house on this wall. You see it, right? There is a town and one of the walls of my house shares the wall with the city. You see it? You see it? Okay. So I let these men down this wall with this rope. They are going down and one of the soldiers says to me, Listen, if all of your family is inside of your house when we come to take and destroy Jericho all of you will be saved but if one of your family members goes outside into the streets that person's blood will not be on our hands our promise to you will not pertain to that person and I say okay then they say one more thing and I'm thinking oh no they say if you tell anyone about what we're doing that we have been spying out the land to take it over the oath we swore to you will be null and void and for those that know don't know what that means it means it is off I say absolutely not a problem I will not tell anyone but my family and my family will be inside they say we have a deal and that's all I needed so I let these men down and then one says one more thing and I think oh Lord he says this red scarlet rope that you are letting us down with place that in your window so that when we come to town my soldiers will have a visual for which house is yours so that you and your family will not be destroyed I said I agree I let them down and I say go up to the hills wait there for three days once the men come back to town you can go on your way and you will be safe they leave and they go to the town and I hang the ribbon in my window as a sign and a symbol that all will be well for me and my family. And now, one of the toughest things I have to do yet, I have to go and tell my family they have to come into the prostitute's house. That is not an easy task. So I go to my mother and my father's house. I don't go there often and they never come to my house. And I convince them I have helped some spies. I saved them from being killed. The king's men were sent to my house to destroy them, but I hid those men away from the king's men. 
And now I have made a deal with them. I made a deal that if you're in my house, when they come to destroy Jericho, we would not be harmed. I thought that would be good news, but they look at me like I am crazy. Like, who are you that these men would come to your house? Why would these spies come to a prostitute's house thinking they could have went to a priest? Somebody who is not dirty like me. Somebody who is uh, without sin, nobody. Somebody who is uh, worthy of the story of saying, I saved them. Not a woman. Please say, throw away. Not a woman who uh, is an outcast. Not a woman who is a nothingness. That's how my family looked at me. But I did not care. Because in that moment, I knew that their life was hanging in the balance of a yes. So my only goal was to get the people that I love the most in all the world to give me one yes. So I said, Mahada, I have not asked you to come to my house before. I want you to come to my house, you and everyone here, all of us, to be under one roof so we can be safe. Please, mother. No, I would not ask you to be embarrassed in my house if there was not a reason for you to be safe. Mother, trust me. I know I have left you down. I know you are not proud of me. But give me an opportunity. Give me an opportunity to make you proud of me, please, mother. And I see in her eyes because a mother knows when her daughter is telling the truth. And a mother knows when she wants something better for her daughter. And my mother, she could see I was desperate for deliverance. I was desperate for something different. I knew. This pretty face, I don't care if you don't think it's pretty. Here I knew this pretty face, I was one day going to lose my pretty. I knew that there would come a day that a man would come into my house and my body would no longer be desirable. I have a shelf life too. So I was hoping, praying, something would change, something needed to change and so when my mother looked at me with that knowing look of I believe you I knew I had received my yes inside my spirit so my family they pack up their things and they all come to the side of this wall of Jericho in the place where nobody wants to be and nobody wants to see you and they all come into my house that may seem like a little thing to you. It may even seem like a simple task. But to have my whole family underneath the harlot's roof, talking together, eating together, sewing and making things together, it was that word together. Oh, it made my heart so full of joy. I was so happy. I was so happy my family was in my house. And we waited. We waited there together. And after some days, we could hear some noises outside of Jericho. It was so loud, like horns or trumpets. It was a sound I, I had not heard before. Not like that. It was just loud. But it was all around. And we were inside. We did not go outside because if we went outside, you know what happens. And then all of a sudden, on this one day, everything started to shake. You live in California, so you know what an earthquake is. 
maybe. <laughs> well, everything was shaking like an earthquake. The house was rocking and shaking, and you could hear bricks falling and things coming down. And I don't know, but I'm thinking this is them attacking. And surely they noticed the red scarlet robe. And there is a knock at our door, and it is soldiers coming to get me and my family and sisters and brothers and all that is in our household to take us to safety. Woo! <laughs> we are excited. We are leaving. But in our excitement, you know how you look back at what you used to be? You look back at those people who judged you and talked about you. You look at those people who mocked you, said foul things about you, spit on you, cursed at you, ridiculed you, whispered about you. Though I wanted to relish and all the fact that we were being saved and they were being destroyed. I had nothing but pity in my heart because their God of idols could not save them. So I was torn because I could not introduce them to this new God I had found. But I was so glad that I was no longer in bondage to a God that could not help me when my time of need came up. So I shake the dust from my feet and I walk with the soldiers. And this is not just an ordinary walk. They take us to safety and we went there and eventually they utterly destroy Jericho. There is no one left there we are the only people that were saved in that town. Imagine that. A prostitute. A hooker. A harlot. She is the reason that her and her entire family is saved. That their God of the heavens and of the earth chose to allow a woman like me to be the woman to carry a family out of bondage. Allow a woman like me to be the one to live instead of die and be destroyed. Because most people would say, kill the prostitute, save the priest. Aren't you glad that God doesn't look at things like that? Aren't you glad that this relationship that we serve and share with the God of the heavens and the God of the earth looks at the heart. You see, what I had done, I had accepted God into my heart without an invitation being extended. Do you know what that means? That means I believed before I saw. And see, you got to see a thing before you see a thing or you will never see a thing. I believed that their God could be my God and if he was my God all the things that had been going on in my life would be all right with me and he not only did that he did so much more. So I am in Israel with these people and their God is now my God and I am living no longer selling my body no longer worried about the people gossiping about me or talking about me or judging me no I am living and how many women in here know that if you just do what you're supposed to do Somebody might find you. So, this man, this man 
name Salmon. I blush when I take my name. <laughs> this man named Salmon found me. Found me while I was just being me. I wasn't like, woo, pick me. And I also wasn't living in bondage for what I was. You see, that rearview mirror is small. And I can look in that small rearview mirror back at the things I used to do, or I can make a choice to look at this huge front view and see what's ahead of me. And because I knew what my past was, I had no place to go but up by looking for my future. So Simon and I, we get married. <laughs> and we have a son. You know my son. My son is Boaz. There's women in here that want my son, but he's taken, ladies. Do not lust after another man, another woman's husband, please. Boaz is my son. And some of you know that Boaz and Ruth, they too had a son named Obed. And Obed, they had a son named Jesse. So guess what that means? Y'all wanted me to fast forward and tell you what it means. I gotta tell you, I get so excited. I want you to know the end before the beginning begins because God does things like that. Before you become pregnant with a problem, God gives birth to your solution. So before I had a problem called prostitute, God had given birth to my solution called protector and a part of the lineage of Jesus. I don't know if you know what that means. <laughs> I don't think your little mind can comprehend how big of a God you must be to turn a woman like me into somebody that is written into the hall of faith. The hall of faith. The hall of faith. It is reserved for great people. It is reserved for people who you talk about in such an awesome way. But God, in his all-knowingness, he put me, he put me in that book. And he didn't put me in that book because I was special. He put me in that book because he wanted you to know that A, he is no respecter of person. He does not love Rahab more than he loves you. He did not care so much for me that he won't care for you. And he wanted you to know that no matter all the wrong that you have done in your past, he puts it in this thing that he calls a sea of forgetfulness. It's like he supernatural washes his memory to remember what you did no more. And when he sets you free, when he sets you free, you are free indeed because that is the kind of God that we serve he is the God of the heavens and the God of the earth and he made us the rulers of the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and everything that creepeth upon the earth but we must know that power we must know his promise and we must understand his protection. If there are some mothers and some fathers here, there is nothing that you would not do to protect your child. There is not one thing. If somebody came charging for your child without thought, you're gonna step in its way. If a gunman come into 
truly blessed. And your child is somewhere you arthritis, bad hip, wrong knee. You are going to make your way to your child to protect it. And you are just human. So imagine. Go with me in your imagination. And imagine a God who sees everything, who knows all things, who is omniscient and omnipresent, who loves you so much. When he sees you struggling and in battle, he is protecting you, keeping you safe. Not this one, she's mine. Not that one, he's mine. That's what my God did for me because he loves me that much because he cares for me that much he did not want my story to end at the prostitute but I gotta drop this on you prostitute that label it was not taken off of me when you read about me even after I married Simon and had Boaz, they still say, Rahab, the prostitute. I do not care. Because that prostitute thing, that's a part of my battle scars. So when I look at it, it is a reminder of how far I've come. It is a reminder of how God is a restorer. It is a reminder of how he can redeem the time. It is a reminder that he can put in me righteousness. So when I look at it, it is a beautiful birthmark of when I gave my life to him and he saved my life. And each of you, you may have some things about you you don't like. But if you began to think about those places you don't like as the place where God changed you, as a reminder that he saved you, as a visual picture that what you used to be and what you used to do, you don't do no more. Aren't you glad that you have a God like that? So, I stand before you as Rahab. Rahab, the harlot, the prostitute, the innkeeper, whatever you want to label me. I wear it, and I wear it proud. I also stand before you, Rahab, the woman that accepted God as my God. The woman that saved her, her family, and all the people in the household. A woman who married a man <laughs> named Salmon. I tell you, I blush every time I say his name. He just makes my heart go like that. And a woman who gave birth to a son named Boaz that women lust after, mind you. They ask, you know, I want a Boaz. I want, there's only one Boaz. But you can have somebody like my Boaz. And a woman who, because I let two men into my house that was not without its danger, chose to defy a king in order to deliver two spies back to Joshua, the son of Nun. So I hope that my one story that leads to Jesus helps you understand how everyone in this room has a story that leads to Jesus if you know him. But don't think of anyone that may be on this stage as someone who is greater than you. Just think of it as God can use anyone, even a wretch like me. I pray that my story blesses you. I pray that you learn something, because that is the main thing. 
I pray that you can locate a place in your life and in your story where God showed up for you. Because I have places like that. I have touched on remembrance of how He came into my life and changed it all for the better. And so the next time you hear the story of Rahab, the heart, the innkeeper, the prostitute, I want you to say, yeah, that's her. And did you hear about the great things that she went on to do? Because her story didn't start and end there. There are so much more to her. And you will be able to tell my story. Not because I am conceited and need you talking about me, but people need a reminder that God can and God will use anyone that is yielded for his goodness. He doesn't need people who are going to brag about what he did. He needs people who will humbly submit that God is enough to fill my empty places. God is enough to make my cup so full that you can take a sip from my saucer. God needs to know that he can trust you with little to make it into much. Do not despise small beginnings. God does not care about how you begin. Some people in races run so fast. They get tired before they get around the lap. But the steady person who runs their own race, breathing and steadily running, is the person that wins the prize. So from my story and my heart to you, I leave you with the reality that David went from an adulterer and a liar to an anointed leader. You all know Moses, he could barely even speak. Aaron was his mouthpiece. But you see what God did with him. Paul. We all know Paul. Persecutor of believers. And now we all quote him. Wish we could be like Paul. But nobody wants to carry Paul's burdens. And so I am one of those stories. I am one. A nobody trying to tell somebody about the person who is all things to everybody. He loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And all he asks for in return, because he does not require much, all he asks for in return is that you accept him. And that as a Christian, that you are Christ-like. That you follow him, that you want to learn and read about him. And when you do something wrong, he wants you to repent. To know that you did something wrong. Not that he doesn't know. You repent for you, not for him. He knows what you're going to do before you do it. But he wants you to know you did it and confess it to him so that he can know you know you did what you did. It's simple, it is not complicated. Father, I'm sorry, I sin. If you do that every day, because unfortunately almost every day you sin, you don't even know you sin. You look at somebody that walk in the door and you look at them and you have that knowing, judging thing and you don't think of it as sin, but it is sin. Or you see a handsome man or pretty woman walk in and you look at them in their eyes and you have to turn your eye, but you sin. So you ask for forgiveness for the thoughts, for the things you do, the things you don't do that God wants you to do. You do this so that God can restore you, so that he can renew you, so that he can remind you that when you do these things, that your slate is clean, right? You want him to cast your sins into a sea of forgetfulness, like he did for me. So God bless you. God keep you. May God prosper you. And may you never look at Rahab 
the way you used to look at her. She is still a hooker. She is still a harlot. She is still an innkeeper. But as I told you, Pastor, she is so much more. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to say, I want to say one thing as Mara. <laughs> My life wasn't quite as serious as Rahab's was. I was never a prostitute or a, a harlot. But at the age of uh, 15, I found myself in a precarious situation being gang raped. And I'm mentioning this to all of you because this story means something to me. Because God would take a woman like me and allow her to do films and TV shows, play opposite Lawrence Fishburne, do films with Oprah Winfrey, Halle Berry, Terrence Howard. He would allow me to do that, not because he loved me more than any of you, but he knows that if I'm on a movie set, it's all about him. The one that restored, healed, and redeemed everything that I was. And so when I stand before you as the woman that used to be those things, smoked and drank and did everything else, cursed like a sailor and would make a sailor embarrassed, I share that with you not to brag about my past, but to tell you that where my present is, God is the only one that could have done that. When you yield and submit and confess and change, repent, that's what change, that's what repentance means. Turn away from the thing, then God will put you in position to do what you're supposed to do. So that's the Bible story, and that's my story in the edited short edition. God bless you. Mwah. I told Sister Mara, I forgot that she wasn't Rahab. And she had me down there crying as I felt her passion, as I felt Rahab's story. What a gift that God has given you to bring his word to life. And we were all made the better for it. Let's give her another hand. And now it's time to give. Those of you that are watching our broadcast online via Facebook or YouTube, if this is your week to give your tithes and offering, you may do so via PayPal or Tithely. You can also mail your payment into our post office box located in the city of Glenwood or come up to the church office during our office hours, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And if you're visiting with us, Please be sure to give your tithes to your church home. However, if this ministry has been a blessing to you and you'd like to sow a seed in good soil, we'll be sure you will receive a receipt for your contributions. God bless you. You can give through these portals on the screen as well. And thank you. May the peace of God yes. and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit Rest, rule, and abide with you from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. And let the church of God say, Amen. Amen. May God bless you.